Contemporary commercial filmmakers have inherited a long history of filmmaking that encourages audiences to forget about the role of the camera as an intermediary between us and what we see on screens. More often than not, we are meant to forget the very idea of the camera, to experience a film as if it were something happening in real time before our very eyes. Structuring a film in a way such that the presence of the camera is downplayed or made invisible creates a suspension of disbelief that transforms artifice into a realistic and believable experience. Although the idea of total escapism into film has never really been true, filmmakers have been engaged in the art of helping us to forget the material production of cinema for a long time. With the exception of avant-garde, political, and experimental filmmakers who subvert film conventions to create various modes of resistance cinema that breaks down the norms we have come to take for granted, commercial film has refined techniques that make us forget that what we are watching is not just artificial, but often simply impossible. In this video, we will start to train ourselves to work against convention, to start seeing the boundaries of the frame, to see the physical construction of the camera shot. Generally speaking, every shot in a film contains four attributes, framing, depth of field, color, and movement. These are umbrella categories, each with their own subset of techniques that are tied to norms of associated, culturally informed, meaning making. That's right, the camera itself is an active player that helps create ideas and stories, just like the narrative and the mise-en-scene. Let's consider the biggest category first, framing. Framing refers to the camera frame itself, its shape, its position in relation to the mise-en-scene, and where it occupies space on set. This translates to aspect ratio, masking, camera distance, camera angles, and camera height. Aspect ratio refers to the dimensions of the film frame, the ratio of width to height. In early cinema, the aspect ratio was more or less standardized, but over time, filmmakers have created and experimented with a variety of options, all of which impact visualization and style. Fundamentally speaking, the aspect ratio determines the basic shape of the film, which in turn determines the composition of mise-en-scene. But in so doing, aspect ratio can also set up different emotional overtones as well. Films early on were limited to the 4x3 ratio, also known as the 1.33 to 1. While this was just the norm at the time, filmmakers since can choose to use this ratio to tap into an aesthetic which, by now, is linked to a kind of classical, nostalgic, or sometimes novice or seemingly more genuine feel. Once cinemas and filmmakers developed widescreen aspect ratios, they were able to capture more lateral space, which also meant more landscape. This aspect ratio lends itself to scenery and big sets, which were readily used to create vast visuals to reinforce big narratives. Now, due to aesthetic legacy, this aspect ratio just feels epic. While widescreen aspect ratios project well onto cinema screens, televisions brought different standard aspect ratios and a return to a more square shape. Even when we watch films made for this intended shape on our current widescreen TVs, they carry with them that television feel. Savvy filmmakers can tap into this aesthetic to reinforce ideas they are exploring in their films, as well as other standards and expectations set by various aspect ratios in cinema history. In addition to the rectangular shape of the camera frame, cinematographers can also manipulate the boundaries of the frame to create new shapes and conceptual ambiguities through the technique of masking. This includes masks that suggest other viewing apparatuses, which in turn inform ideas about perspective and context, or more emotional effects connected to the scene at hand, or again, aids in transitioning from one scene to the next, and assists to editing. Connected to dimensions and borders, camera distance also determines how much of the mise-en-scene can be captured within the camera frame. Close-ups are used to show details and draw focus, especially to actors' emotions. Sometimes, however, this also feels too close for comfort. Extreme close-ups can be more dramatic and can heighten emotions in a scene. They might be used as well to signify specific clues in the narrative or to highlight particular ideas. 
Medium close-ups feature an actor's head and shoulders. This distance is often used in close, but not too close, conversations that we have been invited to join. Medium shots show the actors from the waist up. The increased distance allows for more inclusion of the set and background, helping to highlight the actor's movements, their surroundings, and whatever meaningful connection might exist between them. The distance also allows comfortably for multiple actors in a frame. On that note, two actors in a single shot is called a two shot, regardless of the camera distance. So this is both a medium shot and a two shot, or a medium two shot, and this is both a close up and a two shot, or a close two shot. Over the shoulder shots are a particular kind of two shot commonly used to frame conversations, and it can give us a comfortable feeling of listening naturally to a conversation as if we were part of the group, rather than being right in the middle of the conversation. The medium long shot, or three quarter shot, takes in the actor's bodies from the knees up. This creates more space to include the set and more actors, and helps us to see the careful design of the film world. Medium long shots take us farther away from the emotions expressed on an actor's face, giving us the space to perhaps start projecting our own feelings into the scene. Long shots keep the human figure in the frame such that we can still see the actor rather well, but prioritizes setting and landscapes. Although the long shot is used sparingly in big budget studio and television productions today, especially since they are hard to see on the small screens of our tablets and cell phones, the long shot has been a staple characteristic of Japanese cinema. In extreme long shots, or wide shots, the human figure is almost lost entirely. Such shots are used to focus on the environment, to create emotions linked to the environment, to anchor us in specific places and time, to assist with aspects of narrative such as when characters travel great distances, and often give us a moment away from the action to reflect, feel, and transition from one scene to the next. Often extreme long shots, establishing shots are the first shots we see at the beginning of a film and in new scenes. They are used to set up the context of a film or a particular scene, which can include physical space, emotional tone, information about particular characters, or important plot points. Although it is common to use a wide shot, some directors go in the opposite direction and employ close-ups for establishing shots, putting us in the thick of things before taking a step back. Before we move on to the last two aspects of framing, let's review our vocabulary for camera distance. The last two aspects of framing are the camera angle and camera height. While most of the film is generally shot straight on, camera angles add to the visual experience to create an additional layer of meaning. High angle shots are positioned from above, with the camera looking down on the mise-en-scene. This can create a sense that we are looking down on a character from a position of power over them, or to make a character look smaller and more sympathetic. Cameras placed very high up, usually on a crane or perhaps now on a drone, creates a sense of distance from the actors, sometimes used to put us in the position of an ethereal, distant observer. Low angle shots are positioned from below, with the camera looking up. This can make characters and their surroundings look bigger and more powerful. This often puts us in the positions of victims or of children. Canted or Dutch angles are uncommon for a reason. Tilting the camera off a horizontal axis puts us off kilter and is often used to suggest that something is wrong. For example, if it is the perspective of a character, perhaps they are drunk, drugged, or just ill. Finally, filmmakers also play with camera height. In addition to the common choice to put the camera at eye level, cameras can be positioned high or low to create mood, meaning, and different points of view. Before we move on to the other categories that make up the attributes of the shot, let's review framing as a whole, since there is so much to consider. Let's focus on a familiar scene from the mise-en-scene video. In this clip, try to identify aspects of framing. Although there aren't any masking effects, you can pay attention to the aspect ratio, camera distance, camera angles, and camera height.
Okay, let's compare notes. Many of the shots in this scene help to put us in the perspective of the actress, as if we are looking around through her eyes. These types of shots have an additional name, the POV or point of view shot. We look around the room at her eye level to take things in and then switch to a close up of her face to reestablish her point of view, as well as to see how she feels being in this space. A series of slight high angle shots suggest that she is looking down at a variety of creepy objects, but these shots are close up and bring us unnaturally close to highlight the unpleasant feeling created by the props. By contrast, the medium close-up of the conjoined dolls is at a slight low angle shot from a height lower than eye level. In this framing, the dolls become menacing and the shot suggests a powerful, metaphorical importance. Finally, the medium long shot, also a two shot in a way, brings us out of her perspective to take in the set. Positioned with the actress off center, the width of the shot highlights all the empty space to the right, an emptiness that becomes significantly important later in the film when our actress walks down the same hallway. There are three more attributes to the shot to consider, depth of field, color, and camera movement. Depth of field is created by manipulation of the camera aperture an adjustable hole in front of the camera lens that determines how much light travels through it. A large aperture lets in more light and creates what we call shallow focus. This allows cinematographers to highlight specific elements of the mise-en-scene with everything else blurred. A small aperture reduces the amount of light to the lens and creates deep focus in which everything in front of the camera is clearly visible. Choices about depth of field can create different moods or encourage us to focus our attention on exactly what's in focus. And cinematographers can manipulate that attention by switching between depths of field within the same shot through a technique called rack focus. Although color is also an attribute of the mise-en-scene, the camera and camera accessories also impact colors of a film. Before digital photography, Filmmakers could choose from a variety of film stock, which resulted in different saturation levels and sharpness of contrast. So, for example, in transitioning to color, Ozu Yasujiro preferred Agfa film stock, which made the color red stand out more dramatically. Cinematographers also use filters to manipulate color palettes in their shots, which can change the feel of a scene dramatically or create otherworldly environments. Finally, there is camera movement, which is how the frame moves. In digital filmmaking, it seems like the camera can be and move anywhere and everywhere, but without the extravagant possibilities of CGI, there's just a handful of common camera movements to consider. They are pans. The camera moves the frame from side to side, much like we would turn our neck without actually moving our whole body. Tilts. The camera moves the frame up and down, as if we were looking up and down, again without moving our whole body. Tracking shots. The whole camera apparatus does move through space, often on a track, forward and backward, or to the side. Handheld shots. The camera is held in the hand, a common staple of the found footage, horror genre, and documentaries. Steady cam shots. The camera is off tripod and mounted to a stabilizer so that it can move through space much more fluidly than just in hand. And crane shots. The camera is mounted to a crane, which allows for dramatic movements between high and low spaces or side to side up high. Now let's practice recognizing and thinking about the four attributes of the shot in this next scene. Altogether, those attributes are framing, depth of field, color, and movement.
ケイちゃん下見ちゃダメだよ下見ちゃちゃんと両手で捕まってよ手すり持たないと危ないよちえちゃんちゃんとほらほらやめてよ触らないでよこの映画の Did Minoru push Chieko or did she fall by accident? The second question of the film, and one of particular interest to the police, is Did Minoru's brother Takeru, the man with the camera, see what we, the audience, did not? Was he an eyewitness? What do you think? What do the shots in this scene tell us about the moods and emotions of the various characters? What do the shots suggest about who can see what? Who are we meant to align with in this scene? How might this set up expectations about, for example, who might tell the truth in court? Did Takeru see what happened? When we play close attention, a big part of the mystery of the film is solved in this scene, even though we don't actually see what happened. But the answer isn't revealed through an individual shot alone. Rather, an interpretation of the scene and the film as a whole. Comes from considering all the shots together, their relationship to one another, and how they convey information through a sequence of events. This sequence is created through the art of editing. <laughs> 